Hi, this is Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. Together, we will consider life, death, and impermanence. Because in between birth and death, we lose things, not just our glasses and our keys. We lose identities, relationships, ideas, and more. But what we can gain right now is facing this together, and we will gain freedom, peace, and progress on our path. Everyone, today I am meeting for the first time, as maybe you are as well, Mahisi Kaplan, and he has agreed to speak with all of us today about impermanence and death and all of these important topics. And I just want you to know that he is a person who I reached out to him, didn't know him, and right away he said, yes, I would love to talk about this because this is one of my favorite topics. And so you all know that that means we are sitting together right now with the right person. And on that note, I would like to allow him to introduce himself to all of us. Thank you for being here. Yeah, pleasure. So um, I wanted to come on the, on because this whole topic of death is permeates my whole my whole life, and it permeates all all of life, in my estimation. And um, it actually it was my reflections on death and dying that culminated in me becoming a Buddhist monk and ordaining and staying for 15 years. So you know, I've never been afraid of, of trying, you know, looking at the whole subject and it goes way back to my childhood. So I assume everybody, in fact, at some point, you know, wonders what is our destiny? What happens when we die? Where do we go? How to make meaning and sense out of that is, is not straightforward. I had, I'll describe to you a number of experiences that kind of punctuate the whole sort of process of me arriving at my life as a Buddhist sort of contemplative. Um, I think in early childhood, I remember I often used to sit on the stairs, which is sort of a transitional space, Mm -hmm. and ask myself the question, uh, who am I? And I would sort of scan into my body to look for some sort of understanding of who who I was and then I would feel a huge kind of electric shock go through my body and uh, I understood or I understand that now probably as being a defensive mechanism because what I was finding was I couldn't find any interior sense of self that I could locate anywhere and because that insight was not something I was able to integrate as a child this sort of defensive mechanism sort of blew it out of Mm -hmm. consciousness but I repeatedly again and again kept doing that so yeah I was kind of fascinated in answering that question from a very young age from a very young age wow that's amazing I think and then when I was a teenager, I was actually babysitting for my little sister. I was watching a program called uh, Scars at, Stars at Night with someone called um, Patrick Moore, who's a sort of famous uh, um, astronomer, on used to be on British television. And he was describing how the Earth was going to end with the, I can't remember the actual progression, but there's a progression where the sun becomes... Uh, a, a sort of a white giant and then it becomes a red dwarf and then it becomes a black hole and oh. he, as he was describing this then he said mm-hmm. you know and then and then the earth will no longer exist so I was sort of following this and when he reached that point again there was just this sense of ex- intense dissolution that I experienced mm-hmm. and this huge question of arose in me which was you know how do you make sense and meaning out of life when in in actuality everything is destined to to disappear to to dissolve oh okay so right away you were grappling with the big questions of impermanence and especially when you were watching that show and you saw logically that it made sense i think and, yeah. that, and so if everything's going to go away why bother there was it became a kind of orientation in the background it, i kept seeing the doing of things or things that were done i kept seeing them as fundamentally um, destined to disappear so 
-hmm. you know, I kept seeing the end story as opposed to the middle part of the story. I kept seeing the dissolution as opposed to the manifestation. And that was uh, constantly with me. It didn't scare me particularly, but mm -hmm. it was an orientation. And then I noticed whenever I was in busy places, I would hear this tremendous silence. So the, the busyness, the noise would move into the background and this tremendous sense of silence would move into the foreground. Hmm. And it had a quality of timelessness there. I knew that that silence is there before, before all of this that I could experience arose and I knew it would remain after. Okay. So in many ways, I was kind of subconsciously being nudged more and more towards, you know, contemplative life really without me knowing anything about it. I mean, in those days, mm -hmm. in those days, there were only two or three books around, you know, Ram Dass and, and, uh, you know, that was about it. Ram Dass and um, Alan Watts. That was about all. Sure, was. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. There was no, there was none of this. We are, we do live in a time where we are very fortunate because we have access to yeah. so many Buddhist teachers and resources. I wonder, was it confusing for you because it was different than maybe what everyone around you was saying, doing, experiencing? Well, it wasn't particularly confusing for me, no, because I just, uh, I've always in instinctu instinctually trusted the process. Okay. Okay. So, um, and trusted the rightness of it. And I was training as a photographer. So it was all part of this kind of process of looking and exploring the world at the time, you know, sure. and, uh, you know, seeking clarity. And then um, at the age of 19, I went on my first meditation retreat. I won't describe how I ended up there, but I ended up in this meditation retreat. Okay. And I was taught quite a lot of um, sort of Tai Chi exercises, type of exercises. And without me having any cognizance or no, pre sort of knowledge of, of what was about to happen, I had a, a major kind of Kundalini experience, okay. which was generally called Kundalini experience. I mean, Kundalini is just one word for describing what I would simply describe as this huge vitality that exists within everybody. Okay. There's a vital force in all of us, a vital force of being that has a tremendous amount of energy. And we have this, you know, we have, we have this developmental task of trying to draw close to it and integrate it into our lives. And fundamentally for me, this is what, you know, the whole Buddhist journey is about. Mm -hmm. But what it did do was it, you know, <laughs> just by way of giving you some indication of how intense it was. I lost about a stone in weight in five days. Wow. And uh, it was, I mean, it was quite otherworldly. I had no clue really what was happening, but again, I trusted the process. It was mm -hmm. like I had uh, steel girders being driven down it through my brain. And um, this has been a process that's been with me ever since really, ever since that day um, and so that also really was the cul culminating experience that resulted in me seeking training, okay. uh, going to the monasteries. So I lived in Edinburgh and there was a very, very good Buddhist society at the university and they brought in some amazing monks. I mean, Tartang Tolku, I remember, always remember him. Mm -hmm. And then I met this Western monk, Edgen Anando, who had been trained as a Marine and he was the first Westerner I'd ever met who I felt was embodying something that I knew I hadn't encountered before in other Westerners. And so, you know, one thing led to the other and I ended up um, ordaining in, in the Theravada forest tradition with, uh, that was founded okay. by Ajahn Chah. Okay. And brought yeah. to the West by Ajahn Sumedhu. Yes. And I, I was ordained in that tradition for 15 years. And you were staying still in in the united kingdom area there was a monastery there did you go to thailand or any place else um well they they were four monasteries in the uk and um two in europe so i stayed in all the european monasteries okay beautiful but i was the longest ordained monk never to have gone to asia oh. which in some ways is fitting because i was always looking to the west uh-huh and I got quite deeply into Jungian psychology, archetypal psychology, particularly the work 
of uh, Dr. Robert Moore, who is a professor of psychology and religion at Chicago. Mm -hmm. very, very amazing teacher. Be and I became very interested in that because it fitted so well with the Buddha's teaching on the five Indriyas or the five spiritual powers. So he was doing this work on the Quaternio, what he called King Warrior, Magician Lover or Queen Warrior, Magician Lover. Okay. And um, the sort of pyramidal forms or the shadow forms of each of these, um, what he called heart, you know, archetypes that are kind of hardwired into the psyche. Mm -hmm. And um, this fits with the Buddhist uh, teaching on the Indriyas, which is, um, you know, faith, energy, uh, mindfulness, uh, serenity, oh, and thank wisdom. You. I was wondering, I knew that you must, that you must have found a link between them. Otherwise it wouldn't have been important to you in your time as a monk and now. And so I appreciate you explaining what you found, how they linked together. Well, in fact, it, it kind of, the power of it was such that it actually went through the entire monastery. The entire monastery was very influenced by this because suddenly we had a way of looking at this two and a half thousand year old teaching on mm -hmm. the Indrias and comparing it with this sort of mo very modern psychological language, you know, rooted in uh, understanding of images and film and all the rest of it. And mm -hmm. uh, th the combination of these two things has led to a great sort of enriching process, not just for me, but I think for a lot, lot of the people who have understood the, the kind of importance of, of this. Now, as you say that, it reminds me of how the spread of Buddhism, you know, across all the various countries sometimes can be attributed to the ability to integrate with existing thought processes and systems. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we are moving towards what, uh, there's a phrase that's been coined by the scholar who put this together, and this is becoming a kind of an, 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 an sort of an accepted paradigm that we're moving towards an interspiritual age. Okay, yeah. Of interspirituality, that is where all the traditions retain and maintain their uniqueness, but at the same time, there's, there's a common understanding that there are these technologies of awakening that mm -hmm. facilitate actual transformation within these traditions, and those technologies of awakening are pretty much the same across the board. No matter what we call it, it's yeah, no matter different, what, different what ways to get it. to it. Yeah. Different ways to get to it. You know, I, I've always, uh, in a sense, followed quite quite an idiosyncratic and individual path, but at the same time, always doing my best to be true to what I believe the Buddha was actually, actually teaching and sort sure. of trying to sort of break through some of the incrustations of understanding sometimes that I, I feel actually weren't serving people necessarily completely mm -hmm. or that well. Yeah. So it would seem that you had a teacher who understood you in a way to allow well, you to have your idiosyncratic way of being. The community had a kind of network of senior monks. Mm -hmm. you know, I was kind of in the second wave, but the first wave was about 12 or 15 monks. Okay. So, so and there was a couple of senior nuns as well. So they were my teachers in totality. I wasn't ah. really focused on any one okay. teacher. Per Not se. One, you didn't have one te senior teacher assigned to you. No, but no. You had an access to a community of senior teachers. Yeah. And just the living of this life mm -hmm. under the umbrella of Vinaya, which is the kind of discipline that the Buddha set up, facilitating the intensification of life force, just the living of, of life within that container is a great education in and of itself. That makes sense. That, that makes complete sense, which is why the, I, I think overall, the Buddha was really emphasizing that way of life. And I don't think that the teachings say, if you're outside that way of life, you can't move forward. But I do think there's a, a thought that you will be able to have more growth and move more quickly towards enlightenment, should you choose that path. So yeah, well, I can report on so. both sides of the equation. Yes, you're both sides. So what do you think? So, you know, I had one monk say to me I was committing spiritual suicide when I disrobed. So <sighs> Ouch. That, that is a, that's one extreme. 
And I think that's an expression of a kind of fundamentalism within the tradition. I don't feel that my spiritual, you could say, life or progress has been in any way diminished by, by leaving. Obviously, what is what I do encounter is the difficulties just of, you know, paying my bills and all the rest of it and, you know, not, right. not, not having the support of community, et cetera, et cetera. But it's given me more freedom in a way to consolidate I guess the individuality of my of your my, practice my my, my, my sort of interpretation I'm sure it's not a decision you made lightly I don't it doesn't sound like it was a decision you made lightly when you um took the robes and I imagine when you put them down that was also not a decision you made lightly these are big no, life decisions no it's it's a very complicated story but they they were a lot of forces in play that mm -hmm. led to my disrobing and a lot of them were in the collective they were not you know particular to me i mean i could have stayed but in a sense i was just responding to the direction of travel at the sort of you know that i felt i was being pushed by by things larger than my personal concerns and in the middle of all of this that that's uh, and that's I'm like really shortening everything because there's a lot there right but in the middle of all of this you're deepening in your practice and you're building on what I feel like you were born with or certainly aware of earlier in life than most people and that was the uh, impermanence of all things and beings and who am I really what is all of this yeah, well, there's the what you might call the long body, which is the the view of impermanence based on the idea that, you know, we all understand that some point in the future when we're, you know, 100 will probably have passed away. Mm -hmm. That's the long body that projects into the future. Um, but then there's the immediacy of what's going on in the moment. You know, what is the moment? Right. And, you know, now we're kind of getting down to the crux of, you know, what really is of interest to me. You hear a lot of people talk about be here now or you know, just be in the moment or whatever, but you know it's very it's often quite fatuous because when they say that they often sound like they know what they're talking about. But nobody really knows what the moment is, and if I ask you what the moment is more likely than not your mind's going to go blank and then kind of reach for some sort of something that mm -hmm. you can remember <laughs> for, that maybe describes it. But actually describing what the moment is from the point of view, view of the immediacy of your experience of it, the moment is mind blowing. I mean, that's what it is. It, 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 the, the moment is um, uh, an encounter with the totality of the universe as is, you know? So obviously the moment is, or to know the moment is to be in as a direct relationship with the universe as is, as you can possibly be, you know, without deviation, without sort of reaching either forward oh. or backwards. So it's not me constructing an answer to your question, you know, like you were very kind right then and you didn't say like, so tell me, Margaret, what is the moment? Yeah, yeah. Because then, and then I would have started constructing something. I would have said, well, yeah, yeah. it's this moment when you said the question, but that's already trailed away. Oh, it's this moment where I'm trying to answer your question, but that's already trailing away. And I yeah. feel like what you're saying, and I know you're going to help me with this, is that you talked earlier about having that experience of being out in the middle of the big, crowded, loud city, but you knew there was this silence mm -hmm. and you were in touch with that silence. And that silence yeah. was really what was really there. And that was the real thing that was really there. Now you're when you're talking about like, you know, being in the moment, is it that? Is it that being in touch with that silence? Well, I think I've got a deeper understanding of it now. It's okay. it's more than it's more than that. I mean, the silence and the experience of that silence was a glimpse of something true and real. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was not uh, uh, you know, it was not a fully kind of mature insight. And I don't claim to have reached an end point either. You know, this is I do believe that, you know, if the universe is anything and if the reason for birth is anything, it's for ongoing process of enrichment. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, I don't think that process ever ends because if there were an end, then that gonna be disappointing if there weren't if this infinity of potential that 
that uh, you know I'm an impossibility of infinite exploration. So. Mm-hmm. One of the simple ways that it was always described, and this brings us to the theme of birth and death, was arising and passing away. Mm-hmm. You know, and that arising and passing away, it's not really a sequence, but it's instantaneous. They, 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 they kind of happen together. And that, to me, is what death is, in a sense, because when that, when that ignition happens, then, in a sense, you know yourself as greater than you know, the egoic self. And the greater than the ego, greater than the sublimated. Shell. It's sublimated. It's not annihilated. We're not trying to get away from the ego. Okay. But it enters into a relationship with its true self. You know, uh, you know, the, what Jung discussed was um, this idea of ego self axis. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's very, very interesting because, you know, Sometimes when we think of death or even death in the context of being a Buddhist, we think, well, the body dies and then, you know, then I go into this kind of sphere of light or something, you know, that, that somehow, somehow the realm of, of freedom from suffering is separate from this realm. So you kind of get this separative kind of uh, way. Oh, of looking at I things. go from one place to the other. Yeah, yeah. Potentially. And I might go to the place of no suffering or I might come back. Whereas what this is saying, what, what, what I would s- suggest is that, you know, this s- kind of um, human self or manifest self and your, your, you could say your immeasurable self, they're in a constant process of relationship and that the whole process of relationship exists as a mechanism for facilitating depth, more and more increasing depth. Mm-hmm. and stimulating it you know and, ma- and ensuring that it occurs and one of the things that ensures that depth occurs from this side is death okay you know, loss of the loss of loved ones is such an overwhelming can have such an overwhelming impact that it breaks down the kind of parameters of our what we might regard as our normal world or normalized world it kind of breaks it down it, it, it shatters it i've seen this happen again and again and it, yes and and so there's this breaking down and this heat, incredible impact on the heart which is grief yes like a spear you know that just gets thrown into your heart and it it helps facilitate this awakening of the heart and a lot of this is often omitted in in you know, the teaching of Buddhism, but, you know, mm-hmm. the four foundations of mindfulness, every foundation, the admonition is, you know, centering one's attention at the center of the chest. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's where, where it all kind of, where it all comes together. Uh, where, definitely, where it all comes together. definitely, I have heard other people describe it as, in a, in a way similar to you, is that it's like your heart breaks open, your heart becomes so full that it, there's no other choice but then for it to break wide open and yeah. it's in that breaking wide open that if we allow it we have the growth we have the increased compassion for ourselves and others if we allow it i mean definitely there are people who are closed off to the experience but those Absolutely. people aren't even gonna those people aren't even listening to us talk <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's all a question of you can have it's an initiation, but you can have an a fail, you can have failed initiations. They can okay. go badly wrong. So the initiations that work tend to be stewarded by somebody who understands the process and can mm-hmm. help and can help educate you in a sense through the process. So you know, this is doesn't necessarily happen by accident. For example, you know, the whole monastic training is just mm-hmm. basically designed to keep you in a sense on the meditation mat. So you, there's no escape. Right. So there's, you know, you can't resort to alcohol, you can't resort to food, you can't resort to sex, you can't resort to, you know, traveling, you can't, you know, you're just stuck with it. So this is why the Buddha's teaching on patient endurance is so central. You know, that is the one thing before the Patimoka, which is the sort of the chanting of the entire discipline Mm -hmm. every full moon and every new moon he would just say you know kanti paramang tapotitika patiently bearing with what you're experiencing is the supreme practice and that's what we don't struggle that's what we struggle with we can't bear with 
what's occurring. But if we were to bear with what's occurring, then we are tuning in to the death process in a sense, the arising and passing away. We get this ignition of this other thing, which mm-hmm. is the, know- the knowing of the arising and passing away, you know, in, in, in that stillness. Somatically, throughout your entire body, there's a whole process quite, um, like, you know, we could discuss if you want, where, where literally, mm-hmm. you know, you, you come into alignment or you facilitate that attunement. You get the rubber to meet the road through basically the, those foundations of mindfulness that the Buddha teaches in conjunction mm-hmm. with the breath, in conjunction with the breath. But the Buddha wasn't teaching mindfulness of breathing through the nose. That's another, I think, error that a lot of Theravada teachers are making. Oh, um, will you expand on that? Because that is such a popular teaching. Yeah, I think it's wrong. Okay. I, don't think, I don't think it's anything to do with what the Buddha was teaching. Okay. <laughs> what would you think would be the, so if you were, so you're teaching me from scratch, let's say, and I've yeah. been, I've been indoctrinated in the, you know, watch the breath, um, feel it through the nostrils, feel it in and out. So definitely. And yeah, I have sat that way. What would you teach me? Well, um, well, first of all, if I were to teach you, I would probably start with lying down. Okay. Um, lying down, knees up, just to reduce the body pain. So you can begin to tune into the subtlety of um, what I believe the Buddha was pointing to. Okay. Uh, fundamentally. Um, so I, what I would teach you, I generally, you know, it, it's based on pointing out instruction. So it's, it's quite detailed pointing out instruction. And for example, we would take, say, just the sensation of your two fingers touching together. Okay. And it, it can be any sensation, basically, because, because um, it's, all, it's all one fundamentally. Sure. And then I would start teaching you just to notice the very subtle changes in sensation that occur as uh, you breathe in and out. Okay. Uh, the, the tingling, the subtle tingling. And then I would get you to explore with eyes closed, for example, the nature of that sensation in the sense of how big is it? Okay. Where does it begin? Where does it end? Mm-hmm. I would then ask you to see if you can see a point of separation between say your thumb and your finger in the sensation, not ah. conceptually, but experientially. We're learning okay. to trust direct experience here. So I'm beginning to put you more and more into the sensation. I'm going to ask you, what is the measure of the sensation? Can you find an end to it? Is the sensation, you know, can you find an enter or is it without Mm -hmm. end? Then I'm going to ask you to experience the sensation that you can feel outside of your two fingers touching. Okay. Space surrounding them. And can you feel in that subtle breath, there is a, a flow it's a very subtle flow that you can feel with the air coming in through the cells. Mm-hmm. So if you imagine that your two fingers are porous and that as you breathe in, that there's, in a sense, you can feel that what's been called the inner breath passes through mm-hmm. from the outside to the inside. And as you breathe out, it passes from the inside back out. Then I go through the same process again with you, like sensing through your two fingers the space in which they're situated how big is that space how far does it extend is it up or down is it round or square um all of this Mm -hmm. and then the the sort of the mind-blowing one is can you discover in your actual experience a point of separation between what you would commonly understand to be the, the inside of your fingers and the outside and once you've sort of established that sensitivity obviously you can't discover a point of separation between in and out and you're feeling a then you're beginning to feel a kind of a quality of expansion and this is the jitta the jitta that you okay okay so you're beginning to feel the quality of expansion and then you can begin to you know it goes on from there so that's the that's that's the entry point what you basically do is you go through your entire body doing that and so mm-hmm. you end up with this whole body breath. So in a sense, um, you know, we can, we can get to the point where you can say, you know, feel the sensation at the t- top of your head, feel the sensation at the tip of your toes. Can you find a point, you know, how big is that? How small right. is that? How far does that go? So you just end up with this whole breathing body of sensation. And it's your breath becomes more refined. and. Mm-hmm your focus on the breath is is 
established as through the cells, you know, and then by extension, you can do that same contemplation with anything physical. So the chair you're sitting in, you actually discover the chair you're sitting in has the same, exactly the same characteristics oh. as, as a sensation, as the interior sensation of your body. So you suddenly mm -hmm. discover that everything in a sense, you become established in this field of aliveness. So, you know, okay. I've, I've taken people who've been practicing for 30 years through this process and they've come mm -hmm. to me afterwards and said, God, I've, you know, I'd never understood this before until now. And you can literally facilitate this in about 20 minutes, as opposed to people coming in off the street, sitting cross-legged with painful knees, being told to breathe in, breathe out and watch <laughs> their, mind, and watch their minds. Uh -huh. and, you, and just endure a kind of a lot of difficulty without really much reward. I have seen people encounter that as a barrier. And, you know, it depends on who they're sitting with. I've seen different responses, right? Of, mm. you know, there's kind of that like, oh, you know, suck it up. This is part of it. You know, get over the knee pain thing to, you okay. know, well, let's find another way to be comfortable. But yes, I do think that sometimes there's too much focus on the, this is the right exact way to be sitting. And if you're not doing this, then it's all over for you. And yes. I don't, I don't believe. I don't think the Buddha taught that. What I think the Buddha taught was, I think he taught, you know, Anapanasati, that if just take the etymology of the word. Yeah. Uh, Anna has roots in the idea of Atman, also atmosphere or ether or vapor sphere. So mm -hmm. you've got, all these uh, connotations coming from the word anapanasati. Uh, pana comes from the idea of uh, pranas, so mm -hmm. the electricity of being, as uh, you know, Madame Blavatsky would have called it, or holy wind, as the Navajo Indians would have called it, or yes. uh, ruach, as the Kabbalistic traditions would have called it, kundalini in the Hindu traditions. You know, it's all mm -hmm. it's all the same thing. And then um, sati is you know be, being present to so anapanasati in a sense is being present to the electricity of the ultimate mm -hmm. or being present to the holy wind just take the word itself it's not saying be present to the breath coming in through your nose it's That's much bigger what than it's that inferring. it's much bigger than that people aren't being served well by just being taught the breath meditation in without this deeper instruction sure this what you might call the outer breath, but it's the inner breath that the Buddha is teaching about. Mm -hmm. Because then he goes on, you know, having established that mindfulness of uh, um, tension at the center of the chest, then establishing the mindfulness of breathing in this way, you contemplate the body both internally and externally. If you look at this scripture, that's actually what it says. Mm -hmm. And I never really understood for many years what they really meant by externally I used to think well it's just a mistranslation I just ignored that oh you know because you tend to think uh, you tend to think when you're practicing you know it's all about what's inside of this skin more more than what's outside you right. don't tend to view what's outside as being of equal importance to what's inside so how do you contemplate the body both internally and externally Mm -hmm. Well, when you do this kind of breathing, then that starts to make sense because because you, you see it as I intimated. Yeah, you're establishing a sensitivity both to both the internal and external environment, then contemplating the Vedana both internally and externally. Well, what does that mean? You reach a point in your practice where the bird doesn't fly past you, but the bird flies through you. So you actually experience it in your body as a total mm -hmm. sensation. That's, uh, and then, you know, contemplating the jitta, both internally and externally, well, what does that mean? Well, in a, to me, it, it has to do with um, more to do with the luminosities of the mind. You know, you're beginning to um, experience luminosity both internally, but also in the objects that you're experiencing. And they, everything becomes porous. So the seeming solid solidity of the world all starts to become porous. And you get what I would describe as this intersubjectivity so you're penetrated by things from the outside mm -hmm. and you're simultaneously penetrating their surface appearance from this from your the inside out so that helps reorientate the two big questions about what's going on the who is on the inside the who mm -hmm. am i who and am i what and the what is on the outside so the who is and the and the what is 
all starts to make sense because then you're in a sense becoming entering the stream of dhamma this okay. stream of knowing where everything is informing you continuously informing you of you you could say its appearance and its sort of original nature simultaneously so there's this constant relationship going on and constant deepening so the fourth foundation of mindfulness as you no doubt know is the contemplation of dhammas so you you enter into this kind of process of ongoing deepening but at this point you experience the body is greatly expanded you don't just as the experience of your two fingers touching can become mm -hmm. an oceanic experience of sensation similar similarly the experience of your body is an isolated it appears isolated when you look at it with your eyes yeah and when people but speak we're to not. you but we're not but the interior experience is, mm -hmm. ocean, is, is is oceanic so gradually you begin to let go of identification with the body itself so there's this gradual sort of revolution and uh, identification with the body starts to become less and less as you become in a sense transition more and more into the luminosity of your essential nature and the you know that sort of in a sense becomes a place of rest your true home it's not that you're leaving or departing okay it's just that you have a, a lot more options as uh, okay and, can and we you feel a lot less trapped Yes. Can we can we examine that for a little minute, yeah. if you don't mind? OK, um, so I have a few questions. And the first one is I'm wondering, as you're saying this, I'm thinking, first of all, somebody could have tried to teach me this before and I just wasn't ready for the lesson. So let's definitely let's acknowledge this. Yeah. Also, I wonder some people not to teach it because they don't think some of us are ready. Or do you think it's not taught because there is not an understanding? I think it's not taught because it's not realized. Okay. And I'm, I'm wondering that there are, I'm certain that there are advanced people who have had the experience you're describing, but then maybe I'm don't, not know how to, to be, don't know how to turn around and teach it. There's that, they're called Pacheka Buddhas, they're silent Buddhas. Yes, yes. In that they've got a authentic depth of realization, but they don't have the skill of, to teach it. To teach it. Yeah, and maybe they don't even realize that they're on to something, you know, they might, I, I can't speak for anyone because I'm not one of them. Okay, so there's that. Okay, and then as I have this experience, this, and I experienced the luminosity, then I'm thinking this is what helps me to really grasp and do uh, and become more comfortable with my overall impermanence and also letting go uh, the sublimation of the of the ego. Sure, in a way like the grit that creates the pearl and the oyster the universe is always going to keep intensifying the opportunity to to continuously deepen mm -hmm. your capacity to find that refuge and this is what essentially to me this is what wisdom is is when you're faced with something that seems opaque and dense and overwhelming and you know beyond tolerable it's the is the ability to t to take that and see the space in it to see the freedom in it through going through fundamentally this mm -hmm. exactly the same principles as i sort of was describing in a broad stroke earlier so for example when somebody dies and you're hit with this grief that knocks you out right uh, which is fine you know it's not that you're supposed to sort of rectify instantly with wisdom and start bouncing around being happy yes that, yes definitely it, it, it's that you're willing to you have an a, a capacity to stay present to the experience and intensity of that grief yes. without deviation and find some semblance of peace and release even mm -hmm. in the presence of something which is so seemingly unbearable so you know this is what master wa said mm -hmm. he's in your part of the world or he was city of ten thousand buddhas you know when asked what have you learned from all your years of practice he said fundamentally i've learned everything is okay so what that means is yes you're experiencing grief but at the same time you're experiencing something deeper than the, mm -hmm. that gives you a sense of it's okay for the grief to stay present and 
do whatever work it is going to do on me, which will fundamentally turn you into a more compassionate person. And this is where I think for many of us, some of our culture outside of Buddhism works, I'll use the phrase against us for lack of a better term, if we exist in a culture where we're taught to hide difficult emotions, to get through it as quickly as possible, to suck it up. And I, and I think that that's where I really want to first wanted to start talking about death was the observation I was having of myself and, and everyone around me in these scenarios and where people kind of want, you know, hurry up and get through it type of thing. And it's not something to hurry up and get through, I believe. Right? Exactly. And yes. we don't really have an appreciation for the stages of life. Yes. Particularly, but not only that, we don't, we really don't have an appreciation for the, you could say this stages of consciousness that we go through as we deepen as human beings. I mean, it, it's, it's not commonly understood that there are these uh, sort of cycles of growth right. that we can continue to go through past just becoming a functional adult. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma Podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on margaretmaloney.com, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.